know the ending of this movie? Thanks, Internet! You're watching Beyond the Trailer's review of The Amazing Spider-Man 2. The future. We have plans for you, Peter Parker. You wanted to be the hero. Need a hand? Now you gotta pay the price. We have the power now. We can change the world. Then let's go catch a spider. Yes, spoilers have become a necessary evil in the internet age. Plus, we're guilty of spoiling quite a few films for our foreign friends when, for decades, films were released stateside months before they hit theaters overseas. So how can we complain now that we're the ones late to the party? Well, it seems The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is a special situation. As soon as it debuted two weeks early overseas, foreign viewers took to the internets with a vengeance, intentionally posting spoilers far and wide about the ending of the film, in detail. When I asked one such spoiler why he would do such a thing, his response was he was saving me from seeing the film. What? There's a shocker worthy of Electro. The big trend these days is for blockbusters to debut overseas first so they can build a buzz ahead of their U.S. release. But if foreign audiences don't like the movie? Granted, some foreign moviegoers have had a positive response, but no momentum seems to have come out of this early foreign release. Now the big question is will it slow Spidey down instead? And even beyond spoilers from those who've already seen the film, Sony is guilty of putting out spoilers themselves with the film's ad campaign. In the final stages, with TV spots and interviews with the cast, they made it no secret that they're finally doing the big storyline. Now true, that is a famous comic book story that anyone even vaguely familiar with Spider-Man already knows. In fact, it echoes another recent comic book plot point that Marvel Studios realized they couldn't keep secret, and that's the identity of the Winter Soldier. Oh, come on! You knew that! You can see his face on the poster! Anyway, perhaps Marvel actually realized that early on, which was why they never fully explored the emotional impact such a reveal had on Steve Rogers. Will The Amazing Spider-Man 2 give the the attention it truly deserves? A crucial moment for the character right up there with the death of Uncle Ben? Wait a minute! We did spend most of the last movie just waiting for him to die too, didn't we? If there was ever a case against adapting famous comic book stories for the big screen rather than telling original stories, Spidey would be the prime example. I mean, take Man of Steel. Nobody saw that coming. Or is it that at the end of the day, at least with Spider-Man, all that matters is that he swings up into your face so close you could almost touch him? Wow, Sony is betting very heavily on the Sinister Six to the point where I would say this is almost more of a prequel for that film than a film in its own right. And that is certainly a very interesting choice for Sony to make. Some might even say it's an odd choice. And I think it speaks to this cinematic universe almost arms race that's going on in Hollywood right now where you see both Sony and DC so eager to build their own competing cinematic universes with uh, Disney Marvel that they put that at the forefront of their films. Uh, whereas Marvel, I feel, really has that in the background. Uh, you know, it's something, it's, it's a secondary goal besides having a good movie that you're watching right now. Because it is distracting to watch The Amazing Spider-Man 2 and see that they're clearly more excited about a film that hasn't even been shot yet, hasn't even started, gone into production. Uh, so again, as I said, odd choice on the part of Sony. Uh, there are some good elements here, though, that I think would play into a Sinister Six film, uh, and I'll get more to that, uh, more into that in the spoiler, my spoiler review, which will be posted momentarily. Uh, but I do also want to give a warning right here. I'm going to try very hard not to give you any spoilers here. This is the non-spoiler review. However, you might read something into what I say. Something might, you know, accidentally give the impression of a spoiler. Uh, so I'm just telling you, if you want to go in with virgin ears, and people seem to be very sensitive about that with this movie in particular, and it's very hard to tell what people know and don't know because they're as we've discussed this week, things have seemed obvious that people know about this story, and yet it's revealed that some people have not heard that. So if you want to go in with virgin ears, then go in with virgin ears. And I hope that you'll come back after you see the movie and watch both the non-spoiler and spoiler reviews. All right, so I'm going to continue. Again, my, it's not my intention to give any spoilers, but you've been warned that, you know, if you're going to try and read stuff into what I'm saying, uh, you might gleam a spoiler. All right, so 
One comparison that somebody made with this film, it's one of, one of my recent videos talking about The Amazing Spider-Man 2 leading up to its stateside release, is that it was kind of similar to Man of Steel in that it's going to heavily divide audiences as to the quality of the film. And I think the Man of Steel reference is actually quite good because I think there are a lot of similarities to Man of Steel here, uh, the film. not. So uh, Spider-Man and Superman are very similar characters that have similar strengths and weaknesses uh, from a creative standpoint, uh, but I'm talking about the film that you know, Zack Snyder and David Goyer put out. Uh, so beyond audiences being divided as to the quality of the film, uh, I think the other thing these movies have in common is that they have some great ideas and great elements that just happen to be poorly executed. Uh, so there's like, I wouldn't say this movie should just be thrown out, uh, there's a lot of good elements here, but sadly, uh, not enough to make something that I would say is a great viewing experience. Uh, the other similarity between the two films is that I think they both have very good leads. I, I think that just like Henry Cavill ended up being, in my opinion, a great Superman, I think that uh, Andrew Garfield is a fantastic Spider-Man. I think he does such a good job with the character. He not only looks the role, but I think he's really gotten down not only uh, Peter Parker's uh, humor, his cheesy wit, which I, I thought some, some scenes here, like especially the opening of the film, were classic Spider-Man. He not only swung off the page visually, but in terms of his personality as well. It was Spider-Man, and I just got such a kick out of that. Uh, but I also think that he's really captured Peter Parker's heart, uh, which is a huge part of that character. And I think that uh, Peter Parker wears his heart on his sleeve perhaps more than any other superhero. And I think they really did a good job of capturing that as well. So I think that the main superhero is very well realized, uh, both in Man of Steel and The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Now another similarity is that Hans Zimmer's soundtrack for this film is almost a ripoff of John Williams' Superman theme. I don't know if that was intentional, if it was an homage, but it was so close that I would actually say it was distracting. It would pull me out of the movie, because I'd be like, oh, what great music. Oh, wow, this is so much like the Superman score. I, I almost expect him to fly into screen. Talk about crossovers. Uh, so that was a choice that I thought I found distracting. Uh, and the movie, the movie's very interesting. It plays like a lot of old school superhero films. I felt there was a lot of Donner's work visible in here. Richard Donner, who directed, um, you know, that iconic first Superman movie and the second one. Uh, I guess, you know, he could, he could argue with you to the extent he directed the second film. But anyway, there's lots of that in here. But there's also a lot of weird 90s aspects with like Joel Schumacher almost, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, but that was another thing. They had a lot of, you know, I felt this movie tried to be old school, but it borrowed from too many old schools. And so it just became kind of a, a mess. It didn't melt. It was just stew. Superhero stew. And then another big change that really reminded me of Man of Steel was the lowest laneification of Gwen Stacy. This had huge ramifications for the movie. Uh, and also, I have to say that they tried to adapt a very famous comic book story here, which, I'll, again, I'll get more into in my spoiler review. But because of the changes they made and because of things that have happened elsewhere in the comic book movie uh, you know, genre already, the impact is significantly lessened. It is not as strong a story. It's not as emotionally powerful and it's not as it's not a game changer for you know it didn't feel that way for even spider-man or for comic book movies in general as it was in the original comics that's why it's so famous so that was like uh, an unfortunate aspect of the film and again that was another gamble by sony that i feel they lost we'll see about that sinister six gamble paying off so what oh yeah one other thing i wanted to discuss uh is also the tone i said it borrows from uh, you know like uh uh, Richard Donner's Superman a lot from you know Joel Schumacher's Batman. I see Batman films. I see a lot of both of those. Uh, but the, the, the problem here, and also I'd say also almost Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight, and because it's so shifting in tone, you have a situation where I'm not quite sure what the appropriate audience for this movie is. I would say for a very large part of the movie, it plays almost like kitty entertainment, a Saturday morning cartoon. Uh, but then it gets so dark at some points, multiple points in the film, that you're like, I don't really know if it's appropriate for, you know, small kids to see this film. In fact, I would say that anybody who's not a tween or anyone you wouldn't give a today, a mature comic book today to read, uh, you know, comic books today are quite mature from both Marvel and DC. Uh, if you wouldn't give that to uh, your 
kid or a kid you're thinking of bringing, I wouldn't bring them to see this movie because it does get very dark. In fact, a small child cried for about, I'd say, a third of this film uh, when I was watching it. So take that into consideration. And again, as I said, another odd choice from Sony to be inconsistent in the tone. And also, Spider-Man is a famous character for being able to bring in a wide demographic. He has perhaps, in the past, been the most child-friendly superhero. So to add such dark elements and almost make it impossible, uh, you know, for, for kids to enjoy the film is, uh, again, odd choice. All right, so what did I like about the movie? I really liked the 3D. I thought the 3D was really well done. I thought going with Spider-Man as he swung through the city was just so much fun to watch, and I had such a good time uh, doing that, and those are some of the best parts of the movie. And again, looked like it was right, a still right out of the comic book page. They get all the Spider-Man moves down just perfectly, and I thought some of the electro sequences in 3D worked out really well. Uh, in, a, in addition. I really thought the 3D was very well used. Mark Webb is very good at using 3D. He fully understands how to use it as a creative tool and he wields it well. I also liked Dane DeHaan. I thought Dane DeHaan was a revelation in this role and I've seen some of you leave uh, comments that you wish that he had stayed more Harry Osborn than Green Goblin, which again I'll speak to in my spoiler review. But I would agree with that. His Harry Osborn was so menacing uh, again, I don't want to give anything away. I'll talk about it more in my spoiler review, but he was just superb. And I almost feel bad to some degree that I think he's wasted here. I wish that he was going, because I don't know how, I don't know how this movie will be received, and I don't know how much longer they're going to be able to continue here. It's another similarity with what DC is trying to build uh, over on, uh, in their cinematic universe, that there are so many cracks in the foundation, I just don't know if the, how they can continue for an extended period of time. So I really thought that Dane DeHaan delivered. He was everything I'd hoped he'd be in the role, and he was just spectacular. I thought that his, his scenes with uh, all, everybody, uh, and Andrew Garfield, as I said, was very good, and so was Emma Stone. I think she did as much as she could with what she had. Um, but I, I really thought they, the trio was very, very good, and the personal relationships here continue to be the greatest strength of this movie, not just Peter and Gwen, but Peter and Harry. That was another personal relationship, which I thought was very well done. I also liked that they captured, you know, I said they did a good job with Andrew Garfield capturing the heart of Peter Parker, but I thought the movie overall did a wonderful job of capturing the Peter Parker recipe, and that's his personal life versus his superhero life. Nobody has as difficult a time reconciling the two as Peter Parker. And as I've said before, and, you know, my coverage of Spider-Man as a character, I feel he is, to some degree, his own greatest enemy. And I think that's really played up here uh, to, to a huge degree, to the point where you're like, like, wow, you really are your own enemy, you might want to consider defeating yourself in some way because this is bad. Uh, but I think they did a great job with that. And so I, I really liked that element a lot. So what didn't I like? Uh, you know, I mentioned Joel Schumacher, and I have to say sadly that I thought Electro and Dr. Ka uh, Kafka uh, from the Ravencroft facility seemed like they came out of a Batman and Robin movie. Uh, Joel Schumacher Batman film. It was They were just so out of step. And I feel horrible because I was so excited. As excited as I was for Dane DeHaan, I was equally, equally excited for Jamie Foxx. And I feel he was really wasted here. And I thought his choices were so bizarre. You know, they can't be his fault because Dr. Kafka is equally bizarre. But it really almost to me seemed like an actor making creative choices that they thought would be fun to play. Uh, but didn't fit with the overall film. And the director either didn't want to or didn't feel they could step in there and say, you know, I applaud you wanting to, you're so into this and this, you came to the, I, uh, you came to the table with ideas, Jamie Foxx, but unfortunately they just don't fit with what we're trying to do here. Uh, I would also almost say that Jamie Foxx is doing almost bit for bit Uma Thurman's Poison Ivy performance from Batman and Robin. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he studied it. And of course, that was everyone agreed that was the best takeaway from that film, but the best takeaway from overall a really horrible film is nothing you want to emulate. I mean, just be happy that Uma Thurman kind of got out of there alive. Uh, and so I would actually really compare those performances. Uh, I also didn't like um, that so much needed to happen in this movie. They seemed to have so many elements they needed to address. It was too crowded way too many characters, and they had to get so many things done. And also a lot of the things, a lot of us, some of you might not, but a lot of us going in as fans of the comic and just having a general knowledge of Spider-Man, also the animated series has been long running. There are generations of fans from, you know, different animated series. Uh, we know this story, and it can get really tedious just waiting for it to happen. Like, you, there's very, it was very hard for this movie to surprise me. And I have to say, it rarely did surprise me. Uh, and I think that's not good for the film. And because so much needed to happen, uh, nothing, uh, nothing really did happen then as a result because they didn't have time to really explore anything. And I would say the movie seems so rushed 
rushed. That one of the problems with it uh, was that because it was so rushed, they never had the time to really give you a great action sequence. For instance, when I was watching Captain America the Winter Soldier, as I watched it, there were sequences uh, like the opening or the Nick Fury car chase, where as I watched it, I said to myself, I can't wait to watch this again. This is a great action piece, a great set piece. And Steven Soderbergh even spoke to the fact that he was watching someone watch a film on their uh, iPad at the airport, and the gentleman was just fast forwarding from action piece to action piece to action piece. Because, uh, you know, those are very important to these movies. And The Amazing Spider-Man 2 doesn't have any of those. There was never a sequence in the film where I was like, instant classic, or this is going to be great. You know, I think a lot of these movies do a great job of setting that up. They're like, they're, you know, visual cues to be like, all right, things are about to get badass. You know, buckle your seatbelts, get ready. You're, this is the moment you're going to be talking about with all your friends, uh, and that never happens here. Uh, so I would say, sadly, you don't need to see this movie. But if you do see it, I would see it in 3D. So, I mean, that's, I think, the best takeaway. And, you know, you won't be horrible. I, I really would compare it to the Man of Steel experience. Think about whether or not, if you could go back in time and see Man of Steel again, you could make that decision. If, you know, if you would go just so you could have seen it, uh, so you could be part of the conversation, uh, then go see this as well. But if you're like, you know what, I didn't have a great time, I feel like I kind of wasted my money, um, then I would say you're going to have a similar reaction here as well. So that's my non-spoiler review. I'm very curious to how you guys feel about the movie. We finally got it here in the United States. Uh, we can finally jump into the conversation with our overseas friends. Uh, so uh, feel free to discuss below your own thoughts on the film, and I hope you'll check out my spoiler review, which, as I said, will be up momentarily. All right, thanks for watching. Bye.